Brad and Louise, hello, welcome back. Hello. Nice to be back. How's how's it all been for you? Brad, one, one thing I was going to ask you, which we didn't talk about on day one, the, the way that we're seeing stuff in the UK live is that we luckily have the choice of watching it sort of after it's been out, right? Because if we were to watch everything live, we'd be up at like 1am, 3am. I was going to ask, have you actually braved like staying up and watching anything yet in the middle of the night? Well, actually, last night I went to bed at three o'clock in the morning. Did you? So did you watch one of the movies? No. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Louise, what about you? Have you like ha- what's been your kind of watching habits and watching schedules throughout this uh, this festival so far? I've been getting up, drinking coffee, and then watching two or three movies before yeah. we chat, which yeah. means that um, this morning was particularly interesting. This morning felt like an exciting journey, really. It um, did. Maybe it a did. scarring journey where I just kept texting you going, fuck this film, Yeah, fuck. yeah. I know. It's, yeah. Uh, you've got to choose carefully, I think, which film you choose to watch at like 8am with a morning coffee and breakfast, yeah. right? It's, uh, it's, it's all about programming it for yourself. Uh, cool. So let's talk about, so we've got five movies to talk about uh, that, that have all been on and had their premiere in the last day. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll smash through them. It's a good mix here. We've got witches we've got vampires we've got all sorts of fun stuff so let's start with the feast uh so this is the world premiere of the feast directed by lee haven jones uh let me read the plot synopsis over an evening a wealthy family gathers for a sumptuous dinner with guests in their ostentatious house in the welsh mountains served by a mysteriously disturbing young woman the assembled party do not realize they are about to eat their last supper Love it. Um, Brad, what did you think of The Feast? I liked it. Um, There's a cold, calculated and clinical feel to the film, akin to the work of Lars von Trier and uh, Thomas Vinterberg, especially. It's very thematically similar in certain ways to his uh, sort of Dogma 95 opus, Festen. Mm and a, and a bit of kind of Yorgos Lanthimos-esque mm. kind of surrealism in normality. Uh, yeah, I, I, I probably perhaps I know that you're quite the fan of this film from your enthused texts that I received this morning. <laughs> My all caps going, I loved it, Brad, I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. Louise, I love a, a, a fucked up dinner party horror movie. I don't know about you. What did you think of this film? <laughs> Yeah, so I think I I literally text you and saying it's like a really fucked up Welsh The Invitation and you'd actually already put that on Twitter as if we yeah. shared some kind of brain. So I really enjoyed The Feast. I loved how, I loved the kind of purposeful slowness of it mm. is to start with because you know there's an intensity building so there's serious slow burn there. But also I think it's worth saying that I don't retch at terribly many movies. It actually really takes a lot for my stomach to go. But this was a three retch movie. Yeah. That's literally that's how I'm going to it was at points it was so unflinching and mm. the camera stuck around in places that I didn't expect it to stick around and there were lots of sick and hair and blood and maggots and mm. there was a, the the kind of folk horror natural world roots kept making themselves very clear in this wonderful mod as Brad says, capitalist hungry family who've yes. designed this incredible house in the wilderness. And obviously the wilderness likes to bite back. It's such a mix, isn't it? Because like Brad, you, you mentioned Festin there, which is so, so right. And then also, like we said, the invitation, also folk horror. It's got a bit of everything, doesn't it? What I kind of loved, and I think you mentioned this already, Brad, but like Louise said, it really pays off in its third act, right? Because it's quite a slow burn, but then it does give you kind of what you want as a horror fan, right? By that final act. Yeah, once you get to the leg lick. Um... Oh my <laughs> god! The leg leg lick with the scoop. There's a definite scoop. There's a there's a leg there's a licking of a leg, and there is also a shard a moment involving a shard of glass. Yes. And like, yeah, it was mm-hmm. a it was a it was it was like vocal yelps from me yes. at various moments in this. Film. It was a very similar shot to one that was in Raw. Um, when you, mm. the, the girl's sitting at a fridge and she's bringing meat out. And again, something really abhorrent and disgusting happens in an actually identical shot from the side of being crouched in front of a fridge. You know, the purveyor of food yes. as then bodily 
things happen. But yeah, it was um, particularly interesting that way. But I really did enjoy it. Even if in that third act, I felt like some of it had that kind of floaty, nightmarish imagery, but it yes. always managed to rein itself back in. So you were always centred again, which I really liked. Yeah, it's so true. It's like you said, Brad, it does like kind of, it dips into surrealism a bit, doesn't it? But I think also it remains, I think it's grounded in just this like fucked up family having a dinner party that you can still just enjoy it on that level as well kind of thing. It's a good mix, I think. I noticed you used the word grounded for a film that is about fracking. Oh, another, yeah. Another yes. fracking horror. They're, they're coming thick and fast. Another fracking horror. And actually, there is weirdly elements of it that reminded me a bit of There Will Be Blood as well. Like, it's got such a mix of different influences to it um, in that regard. But yeah, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And I think if you're a fan of those kind of pot boiler, single location, fucked up family dinner party type horror movies, right? This is, it's so good. I loved it. So that was The Feast. Uh, all right, let's 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 move on to the next one. This is a bit different. This is Off Season, uh, directed by Mickey Keating. Uh, after receiving a mysterious letter, a woman travels to a desolate island town and soon becomes trapped in a nightmare. Uh, so pretty pretty simple plot there from that synopsis, right? Woman travels to a fucked up town, basically, and, and wackiness ensues. Uh, Louise, what did you think of Off Season? So the other day, Brad said that I might find it similar to some kind of video game. And you're absolutely right, Brad, because it's basically Silent Hill on an island. There's a lot of me- mist. There's endless amounts of fog. There's horrible dolls and mannequins. There's a creepy abandoned town that seems to be stuck in a, a complete time loop. Um and I enjoyed the kind of fun spookiness of it. I, but I also, in, in the sense of that video game, there's even some really interesting fixed camera angles that you're like, you've just played a lot of survival horror games. But yeah, I mean, I've, I had a lot of fun with Off Season, actually, more than I thought I was going to have at the start because it felt a bit uneven. Um, but it really yeah. got into it really got into things. Yeah. Um, Mickey Keating, Brad, you've got a kind of love-hate relationship with some of his films in the past, right? He, he's He's done some good stuff, but he's also done some absolute turds hello psychopaths i mean he's 31 years of age mickey and has done seven features already so he's a bit of an enfant terrible good for him in terms he's prolific uh but what he does do is he he loves a pastiche and an homage and he likes to like a almost like the tarantino of indie horror cinema yeah so not only does it feel like silent hill it also a bit feels like alan wake Yes, it well. does. Yeah, there's a lot of that. So much fog. So much fog. So much so unnecessary much fog. fog, especially so close to the water. It's very strange. Yeah, very odd. And then th- film-wise, the two films we when we spoke about because we saw this quite a few uh, quite a few weeks ago, Mike. Yeah. Uh, the films it reminds me of is is Dead and Buried and Messiah of Evil specifically. Yeah, totally. That kind of like creepy town with a secret, uh, kind of fucked up residence. You know that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. That that kind of un that unease of a coastal setting Mm -hmm. um because i mean it would be easy to make the illusion that it's similar to the fog but i don't really think that it is i think Mm -hmm. it's a lot more spiritually closer to dead and buried and and messiah of evil i think these are kind of perfect bedfellows to go along with uh keating's off season uh so there you go so that was off season uh let's move on to another one oh this is again totally different vibe this is here before uh directed by stacy gregg this was her feature directorial debut i believe um after new neighbors move in next door a bereaved mother played by andrea riseborough begins to question her reality in this uns settling psychological thriller oh this one was heavy going wasn't it well louise what did you think of here before i think did i send you that gif from lilo and stitch of stitch just pulling his eyes down because i found it i found it so i found here before really really stressful because i think Mm. in that very it's in that very 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 sort of inane normal life way of a family sort of 2.4 children of taking the kids to school doing all these normal things serving up dinner but obviously with a with a story full of tragedy in it um and andrea riseborough is incredible she's just the most incredible actress Mm -hmm. and i felt genuinely i couldn't look away from this movie at yeah. all um, because it had such ordinary I don't know how much to say about it but it had such an ordinary premise that which that was which was so heartbreakingly told um, it was it was stressful in a human way but also you almost 
wished it was more horrific than it was because it would take you a little bit away. If there was any supernatural, that would remove you from the reality of of the tragic loss of a child, basically. But because yeah. we were involved thinking, oh, this is a horror film. Oh, wait, this is much more than a horror film. This is a really intimate family portrayal of absolute catastrophic grief. Um, yeah. So it was it was very interesting. And I, I mean, I, I hate to say I enjoyed it, but it's, it's I really did enjoy it. Um, Brad, another kind of horror movie that is actually just about a mother and grief, right? What did you think of it? Were you a fan of here before? I did like it. Um, I got serious birth vibes from it. Jonathan oh, Glazer's yeah. birth. Yeah, yeah. Um, was the film that it kind of reminded me the most of. I think there's, we've talked a lot about in the past about the kind of uneasiness of mundane domesticity and how things can appear normal and happy on the surface and then underneath there's this bubbling undercurrent of turmoil or tension and in this regard it's Andrea Riseborough as Louise says fantastically portraying this mother desperately wanting her little girl back and and trying to find solace in 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 something or someone in this case um that then kind of toys with the psychological aspects and you know it then looks at it goes a bit babadooky it does a bit but it's just a, a very consistently, once again, cl- clinically told story, which I think if you didn't have Andrea Riseborough in it, would not be anywhere near as good. Mm, she is totally amazing, that. isn't she? Yeah, I agree. Like she, uh, I was thinking about like, she's such a hot, like she's so good. She's so watchable. She's a, she's very good at playing these characters that are hard to read as well. Like there's this feeling with her character in this, same as in Possessor last year, where you don't quite know if like, are you a psychopath, really? Like, you don't quite know, you know, like from the look on her face. And I think this, her character and her performance rides that line throughout this whole film. And the music, use of music's incredible as well. I loved the music in it. I, I even at one point one stopped, moment, it, yeah. stopped it and brought up um, Siri to ask what the song was. So it was just like, sorry, I just want to know what this is because I need this song. So there's some really interest. And also knowing that that's the first time a director debut for uh, Stacey Gregg, you said, that's amazing. It's, it feels, it's really assured. It's really yeah. assured, especially emotionally. I spent a long time, because again, we, and what I kind of love about festivals is that we go into these pretty much blind, right? Not knowing anything about them. And uh, I was for the first half being like, where is this going? Like, is this just a drama? Like, uh, is this actually going to be? And then it kind of really sort of walloped me in the final act with yeah. some stuff that happened, you know? It was really good, really good. Um, so there you go. So that was Here Before. Um, and let's move on to our next movie, Witch Hunt. Uh, Witch Hunt is directed by L. Callahan. Um, in a modern day America where witches are real and witchcraft is illegal, a sheltered teenager must face her own demons and prejudices as she helps two young witches avoid law enforcement and cross the southern border to asylum in Mexico. So it's a, it's a teenage witch film, basically. Louise, what did you think of Witch Hunt? So I actually, I really enjoyed Witch Hunt. I think <laughs> what I really enjoyed the most about it was the fact it creates, it creates this really fascinating, intriguing world where mm. witches are, I mean, it's not a spoiler to say that in the first act, uh, the very first scene is of a witch being burned and it looks like it's from the Salem Witch Trials. It's a, a woman in a very frontier-like blue dress and it says Salem. New England, modern day. And suddenly you're like, oh, interesting, interesting. I like what you're doing here. And it's, it is, I think one thing is, it's not a subtle film. A lot of characters speak a lot of exposition in it to try and get across the fact that this world is real. But I really, I, I found it really enjoyable. I found it really tense. I, it made some interesting choices in the third act where I felt like characters were really stupid. Um, mm. But I still, on the whole, really enjoyed that world and enjoyed spending time in it. And I found the girls in it, the performances were great. I really enjoyed the performance of the mother. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, actually. It surprised me how much it held me. Yeah, I thought it was a cool idea. Like this idea of like, what if witches were real? What if they were outlawed still? You know, what if there were still witch hunts going on? Blah, blah, blah. Brad, do you think that... Like, is that did that execution kind of live up to that idea and that promise? Do you think? I think the kind of dealing with this like Eleventh Amendment idea that they've you know they've classified witches as a you know a lesser citizen or a, a, a terrorist or however you want to kind of frame it brings up some interesting illusions about or, 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 sort of or sim- similarities to kind of immigration and the demonization of the other and the demonization of potentially I think it's got a lot of queer analogy in this as well in terms of the demonization of kind of 
hidden secrets within yourself kind of betraying you and 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 you being held account to things that you have no control over it's it's from birth you know like witchcraft and and and, and things along those lines for me i i don't think it sticks any of the landings it's going for it feels incredibly ya to me young adult kind of like you could put this in the same pairings as like the maze runner and mm -hmm. divergent um where i don't necessarily think it's maybe for me it's for a younger generation the generation that have come after me uh which is speaking to in a language that they understand better than i do a vocabulary that speaks to them and speaks to their truth and speaks to their experience but doesn't necessarily speak to me because i just thought like it's a cool concept and i like the kind of allegory that you're doing in terms of looking at the other and the marginalization and demonization of the other but i don't like where you're going with it or what you're doing with it once you've done it like i don't i don't yeah. get it i think you're right like i kind of felt the same way i didn't i didn't love it but i did also kind of appreciate it and i thought oh maybe this isn't you know this isn't for me i mean louise do you think sort of teenage like 14 year old louise would have loved this that's i think that's who really really enjoyed it yeah i think, yeah, I think yeah. and i think that's what I, I watch a lot of films and go this def or I, I can easily see oh this film isn't for me at all and at no point has this ever been for me but i really think witch hunt at some point 16 even year old me would have just been like this is great and i think what you're saying brad about the the, the sort of the queer analogy there is really interesting because it's the idea that they constantly explore of actually embracing your reality which you might not even know yourself and I really, what I really enjoyed about it as well was the idea of the witch finder wasn't as tense as I wanted him to be. But mm -hmm. I did feel I had a, I had a sort of lump in my throat. I had tension when he arrived with this kind of idea that he could tell where magic was being used with a with a clock, a sort of pocket watch that he had. Yeah. And the idea that someone else could tell almost adds to that insecurity of you can see something wrong with me. There's something that society doesn't like about me and you can just get rid of me for it. And I think a lot of the imagery, while very obvious, one thing that I really enjoyed was the fact that it was saying it. And I think there was the at one point the girls were watching um, uh, a sort of sinking test. If you're a witch, you'll float up. Yeah. And the modern idea of that, of these men with their big FBI jackets on, which are witch jackets instead of FBI, pushing women into pools to check if they float is very evocative in a sense of maybe it's not happening now, but it certainly happened then. And there are lots of oppressive things still happening now that we continue to experience where this is a thing. So actually, I, I really enjoyed all of that and, and kind of applaud it for it. Like I think I think maybe it'll be interesting to see, but I think it might find an audience with like young teenagers. I think it's, you know, probably that sort of film, isn't it? I would have thought. I'd agree. I hope so. Um, so there you go. So that was Witch Hunt. And then we're going to finish with Jacob's Wife. Uh, so this is directed by Travis Stevens, who uh, had directed uh, The Girl on the Third Floor before this. An explosive new power comes into the mundane life of Anne Fedder, played by Barbara Crampton upending her 30-year-old marriage to Pastor Jacob Fedder, played by Larry Fessenden, and threatening to leave a trail of dead bodies throughout their small, sleepy town. So the, the amazing Barbara Crampton. Uh, Brad, what did you think of Jacob's wife? Well, you know that I have an unhealthy obsession with Barbara Crampton. <laughs> I mean, I think all three good. of us here That's do. fine. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. We can all be members of this club. It's okay. <laughs> it's good. The, the Stantons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what I love about her is she is so embracing of genre cinema. If you look at her Twitter feed right now, all she's doing is championing new and exciting directors that are coming out from maybe the short film program or, or from the or, or from the midnight section and we've noticed it at fright fest as well she loves to champion new voices and new um sort of ideals and i think that's a really nice thing for her to do and you know travis as well before he started directing was producing some of my favorite yeah horror films of the last decade so i've got a lot of affinity and love for travis as well and what I, lo what I love about this film is it shares a lot of dna gloopy dna shall we say with his first film the girl on the third floor you can tell that they're directed by the same director because he's looking once again at gender roles yeah, he and is. at this rather than look at, with girl on the third floor he was looking at toxic masculinity and how kind of pervasive and insidious that is and how it can corrupt and destroy homes and family settings and, and relationships in this he's taking a stake right to the heart of the patriarchy and saying this is fucking bullshit like and uh, the crampton's performance is by far one of her best performances i've ever seen 
mm. her, yeah. her perform. And I just think it's a really fun, camp, silly, but also quite grounded examination of m- marital fucking boredom and how <laughs> yeah. how 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 does one spice up a relationship after 30 years become a vampire become a vampire yeah absolutely louise what are your thoughts on jacob's wife i fucking love jacob's wife mm-hmm. jacob's wife does things i think earlier when i was watching her in a wonderful sequence where she is dancing followed which was before where she went to the supermarket looking like the goddess that barbara crampton actually is in a pair of incredible sunglasses i see those eyes brad she is just incredible but i think the even by its very title jacob's wife this is completely that exploration of gender roles and that exploration of men who talk over women men who make women's decisions and and it it consistently addresses that it never makes it just oh this is a fun part of the script at any point when there's spurty veins opening there's also an exploration of why you would want to become a vampire when you get older. She's sitting in front of the mirror, looking at lines, looking at this, looking at what she's become, the idea of aging. And I think actually, which I think we've all become a lot more sensitive to over the pandemic. I know, like, I don't know if everyone is obsessed with their parents looking at it every day and going, did I always have those lines? Did I always have this? Was this always me? And suddenly you can see, <laughs> suddenly you can see that, infinite attraction of vampirism as silly as it is because you get to stay and then you intertwine that with these interpersonal relationships where she settled for some dude that was nice to her instead of her old flame Mm. and the fact that becoming a monster is literally her finally becoming her true self and i i mean i cannot i cannot fault it for that it's just i couldn't believe it was going the places it was going and she was just embracing it and dancing with it and that's fucking great yeah, so do you, good do you think louise it handled the kind of gender dynamics quite well because actually with travis's first film the girl on the third floor like brad said it was kind of tackling toxic masculinity but i think it was doing it in a way that was quite difficult to watch like you're kind of you're kind of forced into this house with this horrible toxic male and all of the women don't get much to do and i think that's deliberate and i think it is commenting on that but i know that for a lot of people they found that very hard to watch there were some walkouts at fright fest during that yep. film um how do you think he kind of handles those themes in this film i feel like there has been some serious script work by both men and women and people of uh, people that have i think there's been a lot of discussions about every part of this script to make sure that it accurately portrays or even challenges some of these ideals um i was i think i was genuinely surprised by how it wasn't just brought up once this was thematically very much the the sort of force that was pushing this movie forward in a way that I just I really didn't expect it to and I think I was just so pleased that it kept going with it it wasn't just a throwaway oh there's a theme here you just deal with it it was this is the theme it's right in front of you this isn't subtext like this is this is the text and that's why it's glorious that's it and then also it's a vampire movie and I don't know like I feel like I mean it feels like it's been a while, Brad, since we've had a vampire movie that feels as kind of old fashioned as this, you know, like almost that kind of Fright Night-esque vampire movie that isn't Let the Right One In or A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night or something. Do you know what I mean? That was exactly what the, the kind of a, the, the film I would say it's similar to in terms of how you know, its tone. Yeah. Because it's camp and playful, but it's also got like quite an interesting undercurrent running through it. Yeah. Um, what I love is that he brought back the Bucktooth Nosferatu teeth. Yes. 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 It's all it's about like, those teeth. It's, it's, it's kind of like it's paying homage to the classics, isn't it? I think this one. Yeah. Uh, amazing. So, so yeah, a big thumbs up all round for, for Jacob's Wife as well. What a fun movie. Um, so that's it. That's how five, The Feast, Off Season, Here Before, Witch Hunt, Jacob's Wife. I'm going to ask you for your favourite, uh, if you were to pick one out of that five. Brad, what would be your number one? Off Season. Mm, interesting. Louise, what about you? Jacob's Wife. Nice. I am going to go for the feast, um, but they're all they're all enjoyable. Split. Yeah, split a nice, decision. <laughs> a nice split, a good range as well, right? Uh, a good a good mix, I think, of, of films to cover uh, today. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Looking for more horror content? Subscribe now for more videos like this one, and listen to the Evolution of Horror podcast. Head on over to evolutionofhorror.com. <laughs>